welcome to the knowledge sharing place. And I met, you know, we've actually met Lisa on Twitter many times, Barbara and I, but we never got a chance to meet her in person. But I was fortunate enough to meet Lisa at the ASCD conference in San Francisco a couple months ago. And I got to see her present um, her Beyond the Classroom Walls, the globalization project that she did. And, and it was great to meet you. You are such a warm and energetic person. And I'm really interested, we're both all really interested in, in your project with new teachers and the mentoring program. So we are very happy to have you here. And hopefully, we'll have you on more often. Thank you so much. It's my privilege and honor to be here. And i um, very excited to be asked to share with all of you today. So I guess um, the most obvious question that all of us would have is, how did you get into the mentoring program? Tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got started on this. Sure, I'd love to. Um, the first thing I do want to say is, again, thank you so much for having me. It's, it's really my pleasure. And um, I started my career as um, actually as a preschool teacher, and I majored in child development, which was really my passion to, to move beyond just uh, a liberal studies major, which was very popular at the time that I was in school, because I really wanted to know how kids think and, and how they learn and how they develop um, um, in terms of their brains. And so I became a child development major, and I was able to secure a position as an elementary school teacher. And uh, I'm very fortunate to come from a family of educators and musicians. And so um, I sang for um, probably almost uh, 20 years in choirs and um, really loved the idea of the visual and performing arts piece being a part of the work that I did as a teacher. And as I secured my first position as a teacher, because I come from a family of educators, I had two principals in uh, my family. I really had the passion to be the first female principal um, in our family. And so I was fortunate to have two amazing mentors, um, a principal and a uh, what we called in our local Southern California district a project director, who took me under their wing, knew that I wanted to be a principal, and really mentored me to be able to do that. So um, I became a project director first and ran a large, uh, what we uh, call a federal uh, Title VII language program. And then I transitioned from there to my first principalship, and I did that for 14 years. And in the time that I was uh, doing my work as a principal, there was never a time where I did not see mentoring as part of the work that I did as a principal, part of the work that I did as an administrator. And from um, supporting new teachers who were crying and devastated to supporting veteran teachers who felt out of the loop as they saw new programs coming through and new strategies for teaching coming through. And I really strongly believed in that. And I was very surprised when I became very active in social media as I transitioned out of the principalship into uh, educational coaching and consulting that a vast majority of principals and admins did not do the things that I used to do with my teachers, which was mentoring. And so I developed in my mind the idea that, well, if this has been a passion for me, I need to take it into the social media platform that I'm very active in. Um, the first one being um, joining Twitter um, very actively two years ago. The second one was, and I have to give a wonderful shout out to my friends, even though they're not here, is responding to a request on Facebook, another great social media platform from Edutopia, who asked who would like to, is there somebody who would like to moderate our new teacher page? And um, I reached out to um, Betty Ray from Edutopia and began my collaboration and my uh, connection with them. And from there, my passion for mentoring new teachers on their website group really grew. And as I started to work with Etcha, I asked a few people in my Twitter group, is there a chat for new teachers? And it's almost as though virtually they looked around and they went, well, no, there isn't. How, how could that be? So from the piece of mentoring, which I'm still doing on Edutopia's website, um, to moving into the chat, which we'll talk about a little bit later, 
to actually um, taking physical mentoring to a virtual um, area is really how my journey has been. And the teacher mentoring group that I started on the uh, educators uh, PLM name really came out of a reform symposium conference of which I am part of the organization team that we did in January. And uh, people were saying, well, we can't seem to connect with mentors in our building. The veteran teachers are either too busy or, dare I say it, too tired to help and support us. So I suggested there, well, why don't we start a virtual group? And um, my team and the folks participating in that thought that was great. So I developed that group on the um, uh, EDU PL ending. I tweeted it out to my group on Twitter. And to date, we have 123 mentors from around the world who are there on that name, eager and excited to have somebody uh, connect with them, be it a new teacher or even a veteran teacher who, as I said earlier, might be struggling with a curriculum piece or a technology piece. And so long story, but um, that's how I was really inspired. I was inspired by the work that I did as a principal and then by the idea shared in this virtual conference with over 4,000 people that there were no mentors in the school buildings for new or even veteran teachers. Um, I think, Tina, one of the things that I'm finding with the new teachers that I'm collaborating with, um, especially in the chat and then moving out of the chat either to the Edutopia group or in the name, is that teachers in their buildings tend to be teachers or educators that are not involved in social media. They're not supportive of joining Twitter. They are not in a, a name group. They don't even know what a name group is. And maybe, just maybe, they're on Facebook. But what they're finding is the virtual mentors that they could have bring to their table, bring to what they need so much more in terms of the tools that they're able to provide. Because, for example, you know, obviously we know that Microsoft has taken over Skype and we hope it's not, it doesn't crash and burn, but, you know, folks can, new teachers can mentor and have that relationship not only via Twitter, via the Ning, via the Edutopia site where they could connect, but now they can do it via Skype. And let's not forget we have email as well. But the potential to do it via Skype, it's almost as though that person is in the room with you. And so, most of the young teachers that I'm collaborating with, because they are actively involved on Twitter or actively engaged in a name, they don't see that as a limitation. They don't see that as a barrier. And in fact, they're deriving so much more pleasure and enthusiasm from the virtual mentorship than they would with an actual physical mentor in their own building. So what about, um, you, know, you mentioned curriculum issues. What if your mentor is from a different state or from a different country? Does that, I mean, is that the kind of mentoring that they're looking for? Like how do I meet the curriculum standards, you know, for the state or, the, or is it more general than that that somebody from another country could actually help them with? And I bring that up only because, um, you know, as, p as people decide to become mentors, they're going to be asking these questions, right? Or, or, you know, a new teacher would think, well, is this person really going to give me the kind of advice that I need for, you know, the state of Kansas or whatever it is? Sure. Well, with, again, with 123 mentors that are there, there are, te there are mentors globally. You know, there's, we have folks from the UK, from Brazil, uh, from Germany, from different parts of the United States. And so it's really very easy 
for a teacher to select someone from that global group. I mean, there'll be somebody there to meet the needs of pretty much anyone. But the other piece of that, and you, you know this, Tina, because you, you know my passion for this, is the idea of having perhaps one or two mentors. Somebody who is from another country can really enrich your work. And so to answer your question, what I'm finding is that new teachers are not looking necessarily for mentors in the area of standards. They're looking for mentors in how to write a good lesson plan, how to execute a great technology lesson, how to utilize podcasting, how to create a YouTube and, and share that in the classroom, how to work around potential blocks that um, technology might have in their building. So they're looking for mentors who can connect with them on, on those levels and not really as concerned with a, um, a state standard per se. So it, it's really very exciting to think that a teacher in, let's say, where Dean is in Kansas could collaborate with somebody in the UK. And, and we're finding that so many of the issues of lacking in terms of um, finance, uh, having blocks, are universal. They're just not something that's happening in the United States. In fact, I was watching a, a Twitter stream earlier this afternoon, and teachers from the UK and Brazil and Argentina were saying that the very tools that we advocate to use are blocked in their schools in their countries as well. So it's a fascinating um, it's a fascinating issue that, that's occurring around the world. So I think that it's very possible to connect with a mentor there at the name that's in your own uh, country, in your own state, but then also pull from those great resources of somebody that's in Australia or in the UK. Well, Lisa, I think you, you kind of summarize that really well about the, the value of, of this kind of a mentoring program because you're right. You know, you're probably already being prepped as a teacher as to what the, the state standards are at your own school, right, with the other teachers being there. So, so in that community, you're getting that kind of feedback. But, you know, in terms of opening up, you know, to other potential learning experiences for the kids, like a global connection, which you brought up beautifully, you know, to be able to, you know, collaborate or figure out how do I use this kind of technology in the classroom and all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're being mentored by somebody in Australia who's done a similar project and the next thing you know, there's, you know, a project going on between the two classrooms and now the schools are connected. So, you know, you can see how opening up, you know, the concept of what a mentoring can be, that it's not necessarily one-on-one -on -one, um, and about, you know, one particular particular topic, but basically it's a whole community of mentors that you can have access to, you know, and when you post whatever question it is that you're working on, you get all kinds of answers. And I think that really I mean, it's clear that, that the whole global perspective and the open channels to other experienced teachers, you know, is, is wonderful and, and obvious. And I, we were talking earlier before the show started, Lisa, about the challenges of, you know, getting people to participate in the mentoring program. And I'm just wondering if even the term mentoring has a lot of connotations with it. And I'm wondering, you know, what would be a way to, you know, answer some of the questions that a teacher may have um, about whether they take on the mentoring role. So if, for example, if I were a teacher and I, you know, was approached to be a mentor, you know, I would say, okay, let's see, I'm already busy and trying to run my schedule. How much time is this going to take? You know, what are the unknowns, right? And I'm wondering if you have addressed that, what, what the unknowns are of, of becoming a mentor and, um, have you thought about, you know, trying to address that question in your in your program? Yes, I think you you really raised a good question. Back um, about a year ago, summer, um, my my fabulous friend.
Joan Young, who is at Flourishing Kids, and I, we did a presentation in the, the large um, three-day reform symposium, which is going to, to launch again in late July, on just that topic. In other words, we did a new teacher toolkit, and what does it mean to be a mentor, and what does it mean to be a coach? And so one of the things that we talked about in terms of the challenges were that um, you might have a coach in your building, an English language arts coach or a technology coach or a science coach, if those folks are even around anymore in the United States. But, you know, indeed we know that they are in some places still in place, thank goodness. And, and that person is going to um, sit in your room and perhaps coach you through a lesson or observe you do a lesson and, you know, give you some feedback later and, you know, help you to execute the lesson again the next time. And, and you, you know, you'll kind of do this dance back and forth with an instructional coach, and that's the role that I served um, when I worked for Kaplan Educational Corporation. But the thing with, with mentors that Joan and I tried to share in that presentation was that a mentor is, is really somebody that comes alongside you and doesn't go and sit in your classroom and, and uh, pick apart your lesson like a coach needs to and, and let you know where your strengths and your deficiencies are necessarily. The mentor is the one that comes alongside when you're struggling or comes alongside when you're, you're needing an uplift or comes alongside when you're having a great day and, and just says, yoo-hoo! And that um, it doesn't need to feel when you're a mentor like a trudge. It's, it's meant to be, um, you know, kind of like a pay it forward, if you will, that you've come a long way, you've come 10 years or 15 years or 20 years in teaching, and that collaboration between the mentee and the mentor is really so um, energizing. It can really turn the, the mentor um, really into a mentee as well, because you begin to learn things from, say, your younger um, mentee that you're working with, that excite you about teaching. And so we, we talked about that, how, how indeed the, the mentee at, at times, or the mentor becomes the mentee. So it's a role of lifting up that individual that you're working with. And some of the, the, the challenges to that might be that maybe you're having a difficult day as well. So how am I going to lift up this other person who's come into my classroom and devastated or come into my classroom and, and is down or feels defeated. But just in the action of doing that, I mean, we know so much about brain research that just smiling at another person and having them smile back, you know, just really, you know, gets the adrenaline flowing and, and lifts up your, your endorphin levels. So it's more of a role of coming alongside and and if you will, even virtually or physically, sitting there and, and helping to map out what that lesson plan might look like and map out what that um, discipline plan for that child that's struggling might look like, map, map out what that conversation with the administrator who's going to pick apart your lesson after they've observed it might look like. So it's a very different role in terms of the way that I see it, um, very different role between the coach and the mentor. Um, and I think that's something that makes people more apt to want to mentor because they're going to be that shoulder that, um, you know, if you need the shoulder to cry on, and not necessarily that person that's going to um, analyze and critique your lesson. So I really think it's important as we talk about it uh, actively in our social media groups that there is a difference between a coach and a mentor. Well, Yeah, I wonder, have you thought of, I mean, I hadn't seen it on, on the page there on your website, but I, have you thought about a handbook of here is, here is what it means to be a mentor and a mentee? Because there are four things that I thought of, you know, for a teacher being hesitant to be a mentor was, you know, is how is it going to affect my own work level and production level? And then what are these new teachers going to expect of me, right? That, that's always the relationship dynamic of how much, how much are they really going to expect me to do for them and how do I politely or appropriately handle that. And then from the student's perspective, I would think, you know, their fears and unknown would be, you know, how much should I expect from a teacher? You know, I don't want to step on anybody's toes. And how much, you know, can I ask? Can, can I actually ask? When, is that, when have I asked too much? So, you know, I would think that, 
you know, if you, and maybe you have, um, provided those guidelines and steps for, for people who want to sign up for this project, that, that to me would be, you know, the, the four questions that on either side that people would be curious about. And I don't know if, if those are addressed already. But the whole relationship of expectations, I guess, would be the biggest unknown. But uh, you know, obviously, getting past that, you have this great potential for some exciting things. Yes, and you know, Tina, where we have it right now is that the first part is connecting and finding that mentor that you think is going to be a good match for what you're going through. And again, as we talked earlier, it might be two. It might be somebody that you really want to discuss, you know, like Dean was saying earlier, theory and pedagogy with, and there might be somebody who you, who's really good at technology, and you really need that person to walk you through the steps of how to produce a good a good podcast. So that's the first step. And the second step of what the role would look like, we're really taking a hands-off um, attitude with that because our feeling is that the mentor and the mentee need to develop that together. They need to feel comfortable going back and forth and being able to have that kind of dialogue. So we've not put any kind of stipulations there on the name. Um, I think it's a great suggestion, though, um, Tina, I really like that, to perhaps add um, mentor-mentee guidelines. So I really appreciate you, you sharing that. And I'm definitely going to begin to work on that. But Have you thought about the potential that happens with, uh, with teachers collaborating together? Um, not just the one-on-one -on -one relationship collaboration, but even as a as a, the popular term right now is the crowdsourcing effect of you know having all these valuable resources being put in one place. I don't know if you've thought about that, I'm, or maybe you have, and that's why you're you've got the Ning site and and you getting teachers connected with new teachers. But um, well, I think. I'm just, at the uh, last, there was an ed chat probably about three weeks ago, and I, and I don't, I'm not able to participate as often in ed chat as I'd like, but um, they were talking about, again, the issue that, as I think uh, Dean placed in our chat room, that admins are not doing, in general, enough to support their new teachers, or even their veteran teachers, for that matter. So on the new teacher piece, though, I said, well, as a principal, when I was in Pasadena, California, I had a new teacher boot camp. And so I had 10 new teachers um, this, year, this one year. Uh, actually, I had 10 new teachers probably twice in my career um, in, in one um, school year. And it was just you know maddening, if you will. But we, I presented the idea to these new teachers of doing a boot camp because I didn't have a support person. I was on my own as the principal of a large elementary school with five busloads of children that came from northwest Pasadena collecting with children in, in south Pasadena. And so there just was no time to do a one-on-one -on -one mentoring as often as I would have liked. So I developed a new teacher boot camp. Now, that is also not a new and you know a novel idea. But when I threw that into the chat, I had so many people say, wow, 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 that's a great idea. Our administrator needs to start doing that. And I'm chuckling because I'm thinking, why haven't they done it already? So I think you're, you're right, uh, Tina. What happened in the new teacher boot camp that I had, and we met once a week at the request of these 10 new teachers, was being able to sit around the table and dialogue together as a team. And when somebody had a bad day, everybody was able to say, well, I had a bad day too, and it kind of rippled across. And then as that all got done, it was like, well, what are we going to do to make it better in this week or tomorrow and so on and so forth. So I completely agree with you. You know, a kind of physical crowdsourcing, if you will, in a new teacher boot camp uh, was a very positive thing. And this was before Twitter and Facebook and, you know, all the fabulous tools that we have now. Uh, and it was quite successful. So I, I do agree with you that the one-on-one -on -one is a very powerful tool. It's a great start. But it's important to follow that up with a collaborative as well. And that's where I think a new teacher boot camp 
um, can really be helpful and supportive. Well, the, the boot camp, just saying new teacher boot camp, I think you well, you told me already that people were excited by that. People get the concept right away. It's not necessarily going to be a long-term thing, but everybody's going to be focused at the boot camp on what everybody's needs are. It's just a great metaphor, and it's, you know, if you can use that online, I think you should. A unique idea, but yet you share it, as I did in the ed chat, and you know, ten people are saying, "Oh, what a what a great idea!" And so that's so I think how we support and we grow from each other. How I ran my boot camp might be might not be how you do your boot camp, but that's okay. Yeah. Even that way, the people that are running the boot camp can say, "Well, hey, I tried this with my teachers and it didn't work." I mean, they were friends on EdChat were shocked when I said that I met with my two teachers, my new teachers weekly. I mean, people were like, "What?" And I said, well, you know, folks, this is what it takes to do the work. This is what it takes to support and lift up new teachers that are struggling, and again, even veteran teachers that are struggling. So that's what it takes. Now, did I always have all of them there? No. But I provided the opportunity. They knew I was going to be there from 4 to 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and sometimes we even stayed till 6. People brought their dinners. I mean, you have to be willing to put in the work, let your teacher see that, and you know, as we talk about, walk your talk. I mean, whether you're an administrator or a teacher or a coach or a, you know, a technology resource person, you've got to walk the talk. And my teachers saw that, and you know, they were profoundly grateful for the opportunity to sit together and have their principal be there with them. And Lots of tears were shed, but they were shed in private, you know, amongst just a group. And the confidentiality piece was there, you know, veteran teachers weren't um, there. It was only the new teachers in this particular boot camp. So they felt very comfortable sharing. And all ten of these teachers were in a credential program. And their credential program was not offering anything like what I was offering them at the school site. How important it would be for administrators to be on board. Um, because you would think the natural community would be in a school community. And you know, if you provide the guidelines that an administrator would need to get this set up, or maybe you, a, an administrator designates a teacher you know, a veteran teacher to get this kind of a thing organized, um, then, you, then you could probably see that being the more natural way to begin this kind of mentoring program. But you can't do it unless the principals are on board. And so is, is that where your biggest selling, selling problem is, is how do, you, how do you convince an administrator to take that on? Yes, um, Tina, I, I agree with you. Um, and that's why. I mean, think of it, the, the enormous challenge of trying to reach out to thousands of administrators worldwide, not that it couldn't be done, but, but it's a challenge. So by providing this group in the name and tweeting out the link, as I do at least once a week, it provides an immediate way for a new teacher who is on Twitter or even on Facebook to say, oh, really, there's a teacher? there who wants to help me. So I, I mean I think it's just um, I think it's just uh, amazing. And rather than scold or berate an administrator, which is something that obviously I don't want to do, this is a good eye opener for the administrators that I know, especially on Twitter, to say, hey, you know, go over there. There's a great person that wants to help mentor you and um, it kind of relieves them temporarily of that burden that maybe they're just not able to, to handle. But nevertheless, I do share with them, it's still your imperative. It's still something that you need to do. You need to walk your talk. You hired this teacher, or this teacher is on your campus, and it is your job as a passionate leader to support and help them through these difficult first years. And for your veterans that are struggling, the same is true as well. Well, you'd think that in an, you know, in an organization, 
it's it's structured the very same way, right? You want to be you want to have a successful school, just like you would in a successful organization. And so, you got to make sure that your people are are being com you know communicating and learning what they need to learn and being supported. So, I bet you there are ways to to get the administrators on board. I just you know it would be fun to figure that out because it it would it would benefit them. Yes, and you know, um, because I was a former principal, um, George Corvus and I, you know, started chatting a long time ago, and um, I have not blogged yet for the Connected Principals site that he runs, but he knows my feeling about principals mentoring and the importance of that, and I think that now that um, uh, we've developed this relationship, so many of us on Twitter and even, you know, now it's carried over into Facebook, there are opportunities, Tina, to share and for me to nudge them and say, have you mentored somebody today? I mean, I think that might be my, my new lead-in yeah. as we move into <laughs> summer. I like that. I'd like to ask all of you, is there any, I have a, a link to a, a um, a survey that I'm doing to help me improve the chat. That I know we haven't moved to that slide yet, or maybe we passed it. But um, that I would love for all of your input, um, those of you that would like to, because I really want to. You know, that, that's just my passion. I'm never satisfied with the as is. I always want to see what could be. So I'd love uh, to be able to put the link in the chat room and have you. Um, when you get a chance to respond to that, because I want the chat to become as deeply engaging as it can be without getting too big, so that we keep that very intimate setting of being practitioner focused and supportive. So I'm going to um, put that um, link in the window, and hopefully, I can get some of you to join me in um, sharing some improvements that I could make to the chat, because the chat is a real work of the heart for me. And I do want to share that after being excited about Ed Chat, and I asked about a new teacher chat, everybody that I knew in Ed Chat, especially my, my friends Shelly Terrell, Stephen Anderson, uh, Tom Whitby said, you know, scratching their heads, well, hey, there isn't a new teacher chat. And I was shocked. Think of it. Chats have been so popular in the Twitter community, and particularly now, you know, just booming in terms of educators worldwide. And there was no chat to engage just new teachers. And I thought that yeah. that was shocking. And so I met with um, last year. I met with Shelley for four hours over Skype because I said I'm going to make this chat the best chat for new teachers ever. And um, she walked me through the steps that she and Stephen um, and Tom took to set up their chat. And so that's the other part that I think is most successful, is when you do the work to set up your chat or set up your collaborative or set up your mentoring group or set up your name, that's when it's very successful. I've seen When you think about it, we can be, you know, myself and, and um, included, be so supportive to organizations, universities that are trying to do the work on the ground. And that's why I think it's so important going forward that we as a, as a Twitter community try to collaborate more to extend the knowledge of the things that we discover out to um, the higher education uh, folks because most of the time they're not knowledgeable that, I mean, I, USC knows that I have the chat because I'm fortunate that I connected with them um, immediately. They were, they were wonderful and the uh, Masters in Teaching USC program in particular, they're very supportive of what I do. But, you know, and that's, that's easy because they're local here in Southern California. But think of the universities like those that you're collaborating with, Dean, and, and around the world. If they knew they had a chat that they could send their, um, 
you know, teachers to, to me, that's just a supportive piece. I mean, I never had a chat that I could go to as a new teacher. And I've had um, teachers in the past say to me uh, that were involved in the chat, I mean, with their hearts open, they said, Lisa, if I wouldn't have had your chat, I wouldn't have made it through that first year. And I mean, my jaw just drops open because what I'm doing, you know, enthusiastically and, and um, as a work of the heart, I'm not really n knowing how big the impact is. So I, I think it's very important that we connect more, Dean, and that we make a point going forward, and especially me as I'm moving into the second year, uh, I really need to stretch and um, collaborate with as many universities as I can and just say, hey, we're here. If you have teachers on Twitter and you want to send them, um, love to have them. Here's a question for you, Lisa. In, on the new teacher chats, do you find that there's much discussion, like again, coming back to like Bloom's taxonomy and the pedagogical approaches and advice that way? You know, it's great that you asked that question, Dean, and actually we don't. And part of the reason why I started the chat with the theme of um, practitioner focused and supportive was that we, I had seen over the year that I had been involved in EdChat teachers saying, well, there's too much pedagogy here and too much theory and then it doesn't go anywhere. And that's no um, diss to EdChat at all. EdChat is powerful and, and wonderful and, and, you know, growing every week. But what I took from that was there isn't opportunity for the, the digging down or drilling down, as I used to say as a principal, to the more practical steps of the very basic things that new teachers need, such as I have to write a lesson plan. I've gotten all these ideas from my, you know, Education 101 class, but I don't know how to do it. So the practitioner focus and supportive piece is very hands off the pedagogy and the theory dean and more practical application. For example, we had a great chat yesterday with um, Celie McKinsey, who is an author and a uh, university adjunct professor. Um, and she teaches creative writing. And we had tons of newbies join us yesterday who have wanted to begin to teach creative writing and didn't know how to take those first steps of how do I do that. And mentioned in the chat, you know, I'm in a university program and we didn't even talk about that. We didn't even talk about how to utilize creative writing with students or how you could connect creative writing to actually preparing for a state level test. And so what they're really looking for, Dean, is that practitioner focused, basic supportive, how do we start, how do we do that, how do I move that forward? And so my focus with them in the chat is not to go into theory and pedagogy, and it's been very well received. window it says as a new teacher I worry about putting my struggles out there in social media for fear it will be misconstrued or used against me since my identity is attached. Any recommendations for open sharing with mentors or other new teachers online? And that's a great question, you know, when we're talking about what's appropriate, what's not. It's a great question. In fact, um I collaborate with the educational writer for um, Good um, here, and she's local in, in Los Angeles, and we've been talking about that back and forth, that um, particularly in California, I'm not sure how true it is in other states, but we have a lack of teachers on Twitter and a lack of new teachers on Twitter. And the, the dialogue that we had is she said exactly what you were saying, Deb, is that her teachers that she collaborates with as she's writing pieces for good is that they're afraid, as you are, to be there and to collaborate. The things that I get from my newbies that I'm mentoring who are not on Twitter is that they don't have the time. So you have these two interesting dichotomies. But 
I think that in the chat, Deb, um, we don't go into anything that would be um, politically um, um, misconstrued or anything that's um, going to be um, potentially uh, upsetting or something that would affect a, a teacher's position in their school. It's very practical. It's very supportive. If your administrator were to sit in, you know, and lurk, as we call it on Twitter, they, he or she would say, oh, this is great. You know, my teachers are getting this hour of PD, and, you know, I don't have to take care of it now because they've already been there. So it's, it's very much that. Now, in terms of the new, mentoring, uh, the new teacher mentoring project, though, um, again, I think the same thing is true. There are mentors there from Mar uh, MB Teach, Mary Beth Hertz in Philadelphia, um, uh, and others uh, around the world who are not there to judge or there to run and, and make report to anyone. They want to be there, be that supporting shoulder, that supporting ear, that guide, that coming along beside you um, to do that um, for you. And, and you don't have to have any fear of you know, repercussions or, or anything of that sort, which might not be true in the actual physical building where there might be a sense of, well, if I share all this with a veteran teacher, if that teacher is pushed, they might have to share with their admin, which I think, you know, Tina and Barbara and Dean we were talking about earlier. Um, so that's another advantage of having a virtual mentor, if you will, is that that person more than likely will not be in your building and they might be in Australia or in California or in um, Nebraska. And the concern for anonymity or the concern for confidentiality being uh, breached is not going to be there because these 123 people on the Educators PL ending, they are sincerely wanting to support and walk you through um, the struggles or the celebrations um, that you have. So I really want to suggest that you you and I will talk more, um, Deb, as we kind of connect it today. But I really want you to feel comfortable that I have tons of new teachers on the chat, and they are nothing but thrilled to be there. Um, and to dialogue, and, and we don't touch upon, again, topics that are um, political powder kegs, as we might say. We don't talk about standardized testing, or um, we might talk about how to prep for it, but we keep the politics out of, well, why are we testing? EdCheck gets into that piece. EdCheck gets into the more theoretical, pedagogical, political arguments. We stay away from that to keep our chat um, supportive and and um, a safe place for you know new teachers to come. And interestingly enough, we get a lot of veteran teachers that join us as well. You know, support. Do you really want to be typing that out? That is then documented. So I don't know if, if I think Lisa is answering that by chat. Well, you know, Tina, I think that that comes back to our beginning conversation that we had about the difference of a coach and a mentor. When I was a coach for Kaplan Educational Corporation, I had to go into teachers' classrooms in South Central Los Angeles at a school that was in program improvement for, you know, on the, going on their sixth year. And my job was to be one step away from um, evaluation. In other words, sitting there, dialoguing, talking with um, the teacher, you know, you did this well, but you did these other ten things terribly, and now we got to work on you know, why is that? Why are you struggling with that? Why are there six kids in the back row throwing paper airplanes? I mean, literally. So Central Los Angeles is a very challenging place for any teacher to be, let alone uh, a new teacher. But as a coach, you know, that was my job. Um, I had to meet with a, my administrators on a weekly basis. I had to uh, share back how Ms. XYZ and, you know, um, was doing. I was assigned 15 teachers, and so that was challenging. With this mentor piece, um, it, um, it's different. It's not that kind of a relationship. It's a, again, the best way I can say it is, it's a, let me come alongside you. Let me support you. Let's go have virtual coffee. Let's go have a cup of tea. You know, how did it go? And, you know, a lot of that is going to be, um, Deb is going to be listening. Listening to you just vent about your concerns. You don't have to put a name to it. You don't have to say where you were a teacher necessarily. Um, but that's the beauty of the 123 teachers at that name is that um, you can share in a safe place there. 
And on the chat, once again, we don't go there. You won't see people saying, my administrator doesn't support me to teach creative writing. Nobody really talks about that. The, the chat flows in just more of a kind of a productive PD kind of way. So um, just want to make sure that before we go that, that you know that. I'm definitely going to have you back on before the beginning of the school year, and I think we should get some administrators on the show, because I, I think uh, those are the people you need to talk to. And I'm going to title the show, you know, Boot Camp for Administrators. 